Chapter 25 When I got outside, it was just getting light out. It was pretty cold, too. But it felt good because I was sweating so much. I didn't know where the hell to go. I didn't want to go to another hotel and spend all Phoebe's dough. So finally all I did was I walked over to Lexington and took the subway down to Grand Central. My bags were there and all, and I figured I'd sleep in that crazy waiting room where all the benches are. So that's what I did. It wasn't too bad for a while because there weren't many people around and I could stick my feet up. But I don't feel much like discussing it. It wasn't too nice. Don't ever try it. I mean it. It'll depress you. I only slept till around 9 o'clock because a million people started coming in the waiting room and I had to take my feet down. I can't sleep so hot if I have to keep my feet on the floor. So I sat up. I still had that headache. It was even worse. And I think I was more depressed than I ever was in my whole life. I didn't want to, but I started thinking about old Mr. Antolini, and I wondered what he'd tell Mrs. Antolini when she saw I hadn't slept there or anything. That part didn't worry me too much, though, because I knew Mr. Antolini was very smart and that he could make up something to tell her. He could tell her I'd gone home or something. That part didn't worry me much, but what did worry me was the part about how I'd woke up and found him patting me on the head and all. I mean, I wondered if just maybe I was wrong about thinking he was making a flitty pass at me. I wondered if maybe he'd just like to pat guys on the head when they're asleep. I mean, how can you tell about that stuff for sure? You can't. I even started wondering if maybe I should have got my bags and gone back to his house the way I'd said I would. I mean, I started thinking that even if he was a flit, he'd certainly been very nice to me. I thought how he hadn't minded it when I called him up so late, and how he'd told me to come right over if I felt like it, and how he went to all that trouble of giving me that advice about finding out the size of your mind and all, and how he was the only guy that had ever gone near that boy James Castle I told you about when he was dead. I thought about all that stuff, and the more I thought about it, the more depressed I got. I mean, I started thinking maybe I should have gone back to his house. Maybe he was only patting my head just for the hell of it. The more I thought about it, though, the more depressed and screwed up I got about it. What made it even worse? My eyes were sore as hell. They felt all sore and burny from not getting too much sleep. Besides that, I was getting sort of a cold, and I didn't even have a goddamn handkerchief with me. I had some in my suitcase, but I didn't feel like taking it out of that strong box and opening it up right in public and all. There was this magazine that somebody would left on the bench next to me, so I started reading it, thinking it would make me stop thinking about Mr. Antolini and a million other things for at least a little while. But this damn article I started reading made me feel almost worse. It was all about hormones. It described how you should look, your face and eyes and all, if your hormones were in good shape. And I didn't look that way at all. I looked exactly like the guy in the article with lousy hormones. Then I read this other article about how you can tell if you have cancer or not. It said if you had any sores in your mouth that didn't heal pretty quickly, it was a sign that you probably had cancer. I had this sore on the inside of my lip for about two weeks, so I figured I was probably getting cancer. That magazine was some little cheerer-upper. I finally quit reading it and went outside for a walk. I figured I'd be dead in a couple of months because I had cancer. I really did. I was even positive I would be. It certainly didn't make me feel too gorgeous. It sort of looked like it was going to rain, but I went for this walk anyway. For one thing, I figured I ought to get some breakfast. I wasn't at all hungry, but I figured I ought to at least eat something. I mean, at least get something with some vitamins in it. So I started walking way over east where the pretty cheap restaurants are because I didn't want to spend a lot of dough. While I was walking, I passed these two guys that were unloading this big Christmas tree off a truck. One guy kept saying to the other, Hold this son of a bitch up! Hold it up for Christ's sake! It certainly was a gorgeous way to talk about a Christmas tree. It was sort of funny, though, in an awful way. I started to sort of laugh. It was about the worst thing I could have done because... The minute I started to laugh, I thought I was going to vomit. I really did. I even started to, but it went away. I don't know why. 
I mean, I hadn't eaten anything unsanitary or like that, and usually I have quite a strong stomach. Anyway, I got over it, and I figured I'd feel better if I had something to eat. So I went in this very cheap-looking restaurant and had donuts and coffee. Only I didn't eat the donuts. I couldn't swallow them too well. The thing is, if you get very depressed about something, it's hard as hell to swallow. The waiter was very nice, though. He took them back without charging me. I just drank the coffee. Then I left and started walking over toward Fifth Avenue. It was Monday and all, and pretty near Christmas, and all the stores were open. So it wasn't too bad walking on Fifth Avenue. It was fairly Christmassy. All those scraggy-looking Santa Clauses were standing on the corners ringing those bells, and the Salvation Army girls, the ones that didn't wear any lipstick or anything, were ringing bells. I sort of kept looking around for those two nuns I'd met at breakfast the day before, but I didn't see them. I knew I wouldn't, because they'd told me they'd come to New York to be school teachers, but I kept looking for them anyway. Anyway, it was pretty Christmassy all of a sudden. A million little kids were downtown with their mothers, getting on and off buses and coming in and out of stores. I wished old Phoebe was around. She's not little enough anymore to go stark staring mad in the toy department, but she enjoys horsing around and looking at the people. The Christmas before last, I took her downtown shopping with me. We had a hell of a time. I think it was Bloomingdale's. We went in the shoe department, and we pretended she... Old Phoebe wanted to get a pair of those very high storm shoes, the kind that have about a million holes to lace up. We had the poor salesman guy going crazy. Old Phoebe tried on about 20 pairs, and each time, the poor guy had to lace one shoe all the way up. It was a dirty trick, but it killed old Phoebe. We finally bought a pair of moccasins and charged them. The salesman was very nice about it. I think he knew we were horsing around, because old Phoebe always starts giggling. Anyway, I kept walking and walking up Fifth Avenue without any tie on or anything. Then all of a sudden, something very spooky started happening. Every time I came to the end of a block and stepped off the goddamn curb, I had this feeling that I'd never get to the other side. I thought I'd just go down, 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 and nobody would ever see me again. Boy, did it scare me. You can't imagine. I started sweating like a bastard, my whole shirt and underwear and everything. Then I started doing something else. Every time I'd get to the end of a block, I'd make believe I was talking to my brother, Allie. I'd say to him, Allie, don't let me disappear. Allie, don't let me disappear. Allie, don't let me disappear, please, Allie. Then when I'd reach the other side of the street without disappearing, I'd thank him. Then it would start all over again as soon as I got to the next corner. But I kept going and all. I was sort of afraid to stop, I think. I don't remember to tell you the truth. I know I didn't stop till I was way up in the 60s, past the zoo and all. Then I sat down on this bench. I could hardly get my breath, and I was still sweating like a bastard. I sat there, I guess, for about an hour. Finally, what I decided I'd do, I decided I'd go away. I decided I'd never go home again, and I'd never go away to another school again. I decided I'd just see old Phoebe and sort of say goodbye to her and all, and give her back her Christmas dough, and then I'd start hitchhiking my way out west. What I'd do, I figured I'd go down to the Holland Tunnel and bum a ride, and then I'd bum another one and another one and another one, and in a few days I'd be somewhere out west somewhere, where it was pretty sunny and where nobody'd know me and I'd get a job. I figured I could get a job at a filling station somewhere putting gas and oil in people's cars. I didn't care what kind of job it was, though. Just so people didn't know me, and I didn't know anybody. I thought what I'd do was, I'd pretend I was one of those deaf mutes. That way I wouldn't have to have any goddamn stupid useless conversations with anybody. If anybody wanted to tell me something, they'd have to write it on a piece of paper and shove it over to me. They'd get bored as hell doing that after a while... Then I'd be through with having conversations for the rest of my life. Everybody'd think I was just a poor deaf-mute bastard, and they'd leave me alone. They'd let me put gas and oil in their stupid cars, and they'd pay me a salary and all for it, and I'd build me a little cabin somewhere with the dough I made and live there for the rest of my life. I'd build it right near the woods, but not right in them, because, because I wanted it to be sunny as hell all the time. I'd cook all my own food, 
And later on, if I wanted to get married or something, I'd meet this beautiful girl that was also a deaf mute, and we'd get married. She'd come and live in my cabin with me, and if she wanted to say anything to me, she'd have to write it on a goddamn piece of paper like everybody else. If we had any children, we'd hide them somewhere. We could buy them a lot of books and teach them how to read and write by ourselves. I got excited as hell thinking about it, I really did. I knew the part about pretending I was a deaf mute was crazy, but I liked thinking about it anyway. But I really decided to go out west and all. All I wanted to do first was say goodbye to old Phoebe. So all of a sudden, I ran like a madman across the street. I damn near got killed doing it, if you want to know the truth. And went in this stationery store and bought a pad and pencil. I figured I'd write her a note telling her where to meet me so I could say goodbye to her and give her back a Christmas dough, and then I'd take the note up to her school and get somebody in the principal's office to give it to her. But I just put the pad and pencil in my pocket and started walking fast as hell up to her school. I was too excited to write the note right in the stationery store. I walked fast because I wanted her to get the note before she went home for lunch, and I didn't have any too much time. I knew where her school was, naturally, because I went there myself when I was a kid. When I got there, it felt funny. I wasn't sure I'd remember what it was like inside, but I did. It was exactly the same as it was when I went there. They had that same big yard inside that was always sort of dark with those cages around the light bulbs so they wouldn't break if they got hit with a ball. They had those same white circles painted all over the floor for games and stuff, and those same old basketball rings without any nets, just the backboards and the rings. Nobody was around at all probably because it wasn't recess period, and it wasn't lunchtime yet. All I saw was one little kid, a colored kid on his way to the bathroom. He had one of those wooden passes sticking out of his hip pocket, the way we used to have to show he had permission and all to go to the bathroom. I was still sweating, but not so bad anymore. I went over to the stairs and sat down on the first step and took out my pad and pencil I bought. The stairs had the same smell they used to have when I went there like somebody just taking a leak on them. School stairs always smell like that. Anyway, I sat there and wrote this note. Dear Phoebe, I can't wait around till Wednesday anymore, so I will probably hitchhike out west this afternoon. Meet me at the Museum of Art near the door at quarter past twelve if you can, and I will give you your Christmas dough back. I didn't spend much. Love, Holden. Her school was practically right near the museum, and she had to pass it on her way home for lunch anyway, so I knew she could meet me all right. Then I started walking upstairs to the principal's office so I could give the note to somebody that would bring it to her class. I folded it about ten times so nobody would open it. You can't trust anybody in a goddamn school. But I knew they'd give it to her if I was her brother and all. While I was walking up the stairs, though, all of a sudden I thought I was going to puke again. Only I didn't. I sat down for a second, and then I felt better. But while I was sitting down, I saw something that drove me crazy. Somebody would written, fuck you, on the wall. It damn near drove me crazy. I thought how Phoebe and all the other little kids would see it, and how they'd wonder what the hell it meant, and then finally some dirty kid would tell them, all cockeyed naturally, what it meant, and how they'd all think about it, and maybe even worry about it for a couple of days. I kept wanting to kill whoever had written it. I figured it was some perverty bum that sneaked into school late at night to take a leak or something, and then wrote it on the wall. I kept picturing myself catching him at it, and how he'd smash his head on the stone steps till he was good and goddamn dead and bloody. But I knew, too, I wouldn't have the guts to do it. I knew that. That made me even more depressed. I hardly even had the guts to rub it off the wall with my hand, if you want to know the truth. I was afraid some teacher would catch me rubbing it off and would think I'd written it. But I rubbed it out anyway, finally. Then, I went on up to the principal's office. The principal didn't seem to be around, but some old lady, around a hundred years old, was sitting at a typewriter. I told her I was Phoebe Caulfield's brother in 4B1, and I asked her to please give Phoebe the note. I said it was very important because my mother was sick and wouldn't have lunch ready for Phoebe and that she'd have to meet me and have lunch in the drugstore. She was very nice about it, the old lady. She took the note off me and called some other lady from the next office, and the other lady went to give it to Phoebe. Then the old lady that was around a hundred years old and I shot the breeze for a while. She was pretty nice, 
And I told her how I'd gone there to school and my brother's. She asked me where I went to school now, and I told her Pensy, and she said Pensy was a very good school. Even if I'd wanted to, I wouldn't have had the strength to straighten her out. Besides, if she thought Pensy was a very good school, let her think it. You hate to tell new stuff to somebody around a hundred years old. They don't like to hear it. Then, after a while, I left. It was funny. She yelled good luck at me, the same way old Spencer did when I left Pensy. God, how I hate it when somebody yells good luck at me when I'm leaving somewhere. It's depressing. I went down by a different staircase and saw another fuck you on the wall. I tried to rub it off with my hand again, but this one was scratched on with a knife or something. It wouldn't come off. It's hopeless anyway. If you had a million years to do it, you couldn't rub out even half the fuck you signs in the world. It's impossible. I looked at the clock in the recess yard, and it was only 20 to 12. So I had quite a lot of time to kill before I met old Phoebe but I just walked over to the museum anyway. There wasn't any place else to go. I thought maybe I might stop in a phone booth and give old Jane Gallagher a buzz before I started bumming my way west, but I wasn't in the mood. For one thing, I wasn't even sure she was home for vacation yet. So I just went over to the museum and hung around. While I was waiting for Phoebe in the museum, right inside the doors and all, these two little kids came up to me and asked me if I knew where the mummies were. The one little kid, the one that asked me, had his pants open. I told him about it, so he buttoned him right up where he was standing talking to me. He didn't even bother to go behind a post or anything. He killed me. I would have laughed, but I was afraid I'd feel like vomiting again, so I didn't. Where are the mummies, fella? The little kid said again. You know? I horsed around with the two of them a little bit. The mummies? What are they? I asked the little kid. You know, the mummies, them dead guys. They get buried in them tombs and all? Tombs, that killed me. He meant tombs. How come you two guys aren't in school, I said. No school today, the kid that did all the talking said. He was lying, sure as I'm alive, the little bastard. I didn't have anything to do, though, till old Phoebe showed up, so I helped him find the place where the mummies were. Boy, I used to know exactly where they were, but I hadn't been in that museum in years. You two guys so interested in mummies, I said? Yeah. Can't your friend talk, I said. He ain't my friend. He's my brother. Can't he talk? I looked at the one that wasn't doing any talking. Can't you talk at all, I asked him. Yeah, he said. I don't feel like it. Finally, we found a place where the mummies were, and we went in. You know how the Egyptians buried their dead, I asked the one kid. Nah. Well, you should. It's very interesting. They wrapped up their faces in these cloths that were treated with some secret chemical. That way they could be buried in their tombs for thousands of years, and their faces wouldn't rot or anything. Nobody knows how to do it except the Egyptians, even modern science. To get where the mummies were, you had to go down this very narrow sort of hall with stones on the side that they'd taken right out of this pharaoh's tomb and all. It was pretty spooky, and you could tell the two hot shots I was with weren't enjoying it too much. They stuck close as hell to me, and the one that didn't talk at all practically was holding on to my sleeve. Let's go, he told his brother. I seen him already. Come on, hey. He turned around and beat it. He's got a yellow streak a mile wide, the other one said. So long, he beat it too. I was the only one left in the tomb then. I sort of liked it in a way. It was so nice and peaceful. Then all of a sudden, you'd never guess what I saw on the wall. Another fuck you. It was written with red crayon or something right under the glass part of the wall, under the stones. That's the whole trouble. You can't ever find a place that's nice and peaceful because there isn't any. You may think there is, but once you get there, when you're not looking, somebody will sneak up and write, fuck you, right under your nose. Try it sometime. I think even if I ever die and they stick me in a cemetery and I have a tombstone and all, it'll say, Holden Caulfield on it, and then what year I was born and what year I died, and then right under that it'll say, fuck you. I'm positive, in fact. After I came out of the place where the mummies were, I had to go to the bathroom. I sort of had diarrhea, if you want to know the truth. I didn't mind the diarrhea part too much, but something else happened. When I was coming out of the can, right before I got to the door, I sort of passed out. I was lucky, though. I mean, I could have killed myself when I hit the floor, but all I did was sort of land on my side. It was a funny thing, though. I felt better after I passed out. I really did. 
My arm sort of hurt from where I fell, but I didn't feel so damn dizzy anymore. It was about ten after twelve or so then, so I went back and stood by the door and waited for old Phoebe. I thought how it might be the last time I'd ever see her again, any of my relatives, I mean. I figured I'd probably see them again, but not for years. I might come home when I was about thirty-five, I figured, in case somebody got sick and wanted to see me before they died. That would be the only reason I would leave my cabin and come back. I even started picturing how it would be when I came back. I knew my mother would get nervous as Hal and start to cry and beg me to stay home and not go back to my cabin, but I'd go anyway. I'd be casual as hell. I'd make a calm down, and then I'd go over to the other side of the living room and take out the cigarette case and light a cigarette, cool as all hell. I'd ask them all to visit me sometime if they wanted to, but I wouldn't insist or anything. What I'd do, I'd let old Phoebe come out and visit me in the summertime, and on Christmas vacation and Easter vacation. And I'd let D.B. come out and visit me for a while if he wanted a nice quiet place for his writing. But he couldn't write any movies in my cabin, only stories and books. I'd have this rule that nobody could do anything phony when they visited me. If anybody tried to do anything phony, they couldn't stay. All of a sudden, I looked at the clock in the check room, and it was 25 of 1. I began to get scared that maybe that old lady in the school had told that other lady not to give old Phoebe my message. I began to get scared that maybe she'd told her to burn it or something. really scared the hell out of me. I really wanted to see old Phoebe before I hit the road. I mean, I had a Christmas doll and all. Finally, I saw her. I saw her through the glass part of the door. The reason I saw her, she had my crazy hunting hat on. You could see that hat about ten miles away. I went out the doors and started down these stone stairs to meet her. The thing I couldn't understand, she had this big suitcase with her. She was coming across Fifth Avenue, and she was dragging this goddamn big suitcase with her. She could hardly drag it. When I got up closer, I saw it was my old suitcase. The one I used to use when I was at Wooten. I couldn't figure out what the hell she was doing with it. Hi, she said when she got up close. She was all out of breath from that crazy suitcase. I thought maybe you weren't coming, I said. What the hell's in that bag? I don't need anything. I'm just going the way I am. I'm not even taking the bags I got at the station. What the hell you got in there? She put the suitcase down. My clothes, she said. I'm going with you. Can I? Okay. What, I said. I almost fell over when she said that. I swear to God I did. I sort of got dizzy, and I thought I was going to pass out or something again. I took them down the back elevator so Charlene wouldn't see me. It isn't heavy. All I have in it is two dresses and my moccasins and my underwear and socks and some other things. Feel it. It isn't heavy. Feel it once. Can't I go with you, Holden? Can't I? Please? No. Shut up. I thought I was going to pass out cold. I mean, I didn't mean to tell her to shut up and all, but I thought I was going to pass out again. Why can't I? Please, Holden. I won't do anything. I'll just go with you, that's all. I won't even take my clothes with me if you don't want me to. I'll just take... You can't take anything. Because you're not going. I'm going alone. So shut up. Please, Holden. Please let me go. I'll be very, very... Very. You won't even... You're not going. Now shut up. Give me that bag, I said. I took the bag off her. I was almost all set to hit her. I thought I was going to smack her for a second. I really did. She started to cry. I thought you were supposed to be in a play at school and all. I thought you were supposed to be Benedict Arnold in that play and all, I said. I said it very nasty. What do you want to do? Not be in the play, for God's sake? That made her cry even harder. I was glad. All of a sudden, I wanted her to cry till her eyes practically dropped out. I almost hated her. I think I hated her most because she wouldn't be in that play anymore if she went with me. Come on, I said. I started up the steps to the museum. I figured that what I'd do was, I'd check the crazy suitcase she'd brought in the check room, and then she could get it again at three o'clock after school. I knew she couldn't take it back to school with her. Come on now, I said. She didn't go up the steps with me, though. She wouldn't come with me. I went anyway, though, and brought the bag in the check room and checked it, and then I came down again. She was still standing there on the sidewalk, but she turned her back on me when I came up to her. She can do that. She can turn her back on you when she feels like it. I'm not going anywhere, 
I changed my mind, so stop crying and shut up, I said. The funny part was she wasn't even crying when I said that. I said it anyway, though. Come on now, I'll walk you back to school. Come on now, you'll be late. She wouldn't answer me or anything. I sort of tried to get hold of her hand, but she wouldn't let me. She kept turning around on me. Did you have your lunch? You had your lunch yet, I asked her. She wouldn't answer me. All she did was, she took off my red hunting hat, the one I gave her, and practically chucked it right in my face. Then she turned her back on me again. Nearly killed me, but I didn't say anything. I just picked it up and stuck it in my coat pocket. Come on, hey. I'll walk you back to school, I said. I'm not going back to school. I didn't know what to say when she said that. I stood there for a couple of minutes. You have to go back to school. You want to be in that play, don't you? You want to be Benedict Arnold, don't you? No. Sure you do. Certainly you do. Come on now. Let's go, I said. In the first place, I'm not going away anywhere. I told you I'm going home. I'm going home as soon as you go back to school. First I'm going to go down to the station and get my bags, and then I'm going to go straight. I said I'm not going back to school. You can do what you want to do, but I'm not going back to school, she said, so shut up. It was the first time she'd ever told me to shut up. It sounded terrible. God, it sounded terrible. It sounded worse than swearing. She still wouldn't look at me either, and every time I sort of put my hand on her shoulder or something, she wouldn't let me. Listen, do you want to go for a walk, I asked her. Do you want to take a walk down to the zoo? If I let you not go back to school this afternoon and go for a walk, will you cut out this crazy stuff? She wouldn't answer me, so I said it over again. If I let you skip school this afternoon and go for a little walk, will you cut out the crazy stuff? Will you go to school tomorrow like a good girl? I may, and I may not, she said. Then she ran right to hell across the street without even looking to see if any cars were coming. She's a madman sometimes. I didn't follow her, though. I knew she'd follow me. So I started walking downtown toward the zoo, on the park side of the street, and she started walking downtown on the other goddamn side of the street. She wouldn't look over at me at all, but I could tell she was probably watching me out of the corner of her crazy eye to see where I was going and all. Anyway, we kept walking that way, all the way to the zoo. The only thing that bothered me was when a double-decker bus came along because then I couldn't see across the street, and I couldn't see where the hell she was. But when we got to the zoo, I yelled over to her, Phoebe, I'm going into the zoo. Come on now. She wouldn't look at me, but I could tell she heard me. When I started down the steps to the zoo, I turned around and saw she was crossing the street and following me and all. There weren't too many people in the zoo because it was sort of a lousy day. But there were a few around the sea lions by the swimming pool and all. I started to go by it, but old Phoebe stopped and made out she was watching the sea lions getting fed. A guy was throwing fish at them. So I went back. I figured it was a good chance to catch up with her and all. I went up and sort of stood behind her and put my hands on her shoulders. But she bent her knees and slid out from me. She can certainly be very snotty when she wants to. She kept standing there while the sea lions were getting fed, and I stood right behind her. I didn't put my hands on her shoulders or anything, because if I had, she really would have beat it on me. Kids are funny. You have to watch what you're doing. She wouldn't walk right next to me when she left the sea lions, but she didn't walk too far away. She sort of walked on the other she sort of walked on one side of the sidewalk and I walked on the other. It wasn't too gorgeous. But it was better than having her walk about a mile away from me, like before. We went up and watched the bears on that little hill for a while, but there wasn't much to watch. Only one of the bears was out, the polar bear. The other one, the brown one, was in his goddamn cave and wouldn't come out. All you could see was his rear end. There was a little kid standing next to me with a cowboy hat on, practically over his ears, and he kept telling his father, Make him come out, Daddy. Make him come out. I looked at old Phoebe, but she wouldn't laugh. You know kids when they're sore at you. They won't laugh or anything. After we left the bears, we left the zoo and crossed over this little street in the park, and then we went through one of those little tunnels that always smell from somebody's taking a leak. It was on the way to the carousel. 
Old Phoebe still wouldn't talk to me or anything, but she was sort of walking next to me now. I took a hold of the belt at the back of her coat just for the hell of it, but she wouldn't let me. She said, keep your hands to yourself if you don't mind. She was still sore at me, but not as sore as she was before. Anyway, we kept getting closer and closer to the carousel, and you could start to hear that nutty music it always plays. It was playing Oh Marie. It played that same song about 50 years ago when I was a little kid. That's one nice thing about carousels. They always play the same songs. I thought the carousel was closed in the wintertime, old Phoebe said. It was the first time she practically said anything. She probably forgot she was supposed to be sore at me. Maybe because it's around Christmas, I said. She didn't say anything when I said that. She probably remembered she was supposed to be sore at me. Do you want to go for a ride on it, I said. I knew she probably did. When she was a tiny little kid and Allie and D.B. and I used to go to the park with her, she was mad about the carousel. You couldn't get her off the goddamn thing. I'm too big, she said. I thought she wasn't going to answer me, but she did. No, you're not. Go on, I'll wait for you. Go on, I said. We were right there then. There were a few kids riding on it, mostly very little kids, and a few parents were waiting around outside, sitting on the benches and all. What I did was I went to the window where they sell the tickets and bought old Phoebe a ticket. Then I gave it to her. She was standing right next to me. Here, I said. Wait a second, take the rest of your dough, too. I started giving her the rest of her dough she'd lent me. You keep it. Keep it for me, she said. Then she said right afterward, Please. That's depressing. When somebody says please to you, I mean if it's Phoebe or somebody, that depressed the hell out of me. But I put the dough back in my pocket. Aren't you going to ride, too? She asked me. She was looking at me sort of funny. You could tell she wasn't too sore at me anymore. Maybe I will next time. I'll watch you, I said. Got your ticket? Yes. Go ahead, then. I'll be on this bench right over here. I'll watch you. I went over and sat down on this bench, and she went and got on the carousel. She walked all around it. I mean, she walked once, all the way around it. Then she sat down on this big, brown, beat-up-looking old horse. Then the carousel started, and I watched her go around and around. There were only about five or six other kids on the ride, and the song the carousel was playing was Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. It was playing it very jazzy and funny. All the kids kept trying to grab for the gold ring, and so was Phoebe. And I was sort of afraid she'd fall off the goddamn horse, but I didn't say anything or do anything. The thing with kids is, if they want to grab for the gold ring, you have to let them do it and not say anything. If they fall off, they fall off. But... It's bad if you say anything to them. Once the ride was over, she got off her horse and came over to me. You ride once, too, this time, she said. No, I'll just watch you. I think I'll just watch, I said. I gave her some more of her dough. Here, get some more tickets. She took the dough off me. I'm not mad at you anymore, she said. I know. Hurry up, the thing's going to start again. Then all of a sudden she gave me a kiss. Then... She held her hand out and said, It's raining. It's starting to rain. I know. Then what she did, it damn near killed me. She reached in my coat pocket and took out my red hunting hat and put it on my head. Don't you want it, I said. You can wear it a while. Okay. Hurry up, though, now. You're going to miss your ride. You won't get your own horse or anything. She kept hanging around, though. Did you mean it, what you said? You really aren't going away anywhere? Are you really going home afterwards? She asked me. Yeah, I said. I meant it, too. I wasn't lying to her. I really did go home afterwards. Hurry up now, I said. The thing's starting. She ran and bought a ticket and got back on the goddamn carousel just in time. Then she walked all the way around it till she got her own horse back. Then she got on it and waved to me, and I waved back. Boy, it began to rain like a bastard. In buckets, I swear to God. All the parents and mothers and everybody went over and stood right under the roof of the carousel so they wouldn't get soaked to the skin or anything. But I stuck around on the bench for quite a while. I got pretty soaking wet, especially my neck and my pants. My hunting hat gave me quite a lot of protection in a way, but I got soaked anyway. I didn't care, though. 
I felt so damn happy all of a sudden, the way old Phoebe kept going around and around. I was damn near bawling. I felt so happy, if you want to know the truth. I don't know why. It was just that she looked so damn nice, the way she kept going around and around, in a blue coat and all. God, I wish you could have been there.